Chapter 13. The next day, Ochuk woke the children up before the sun rose. For a moment, while Morgan's eyes were still closed, she thought she was in her bed, her actual bed. And everything that had happened, from the moment they'd first discovered the portal to when she had gone to sleep, was just a dream. A very elaborate, lifelike dream. She even reached out blindly and poked at the ground, trying to find the snooze button on her phone. Morgan no didn't know it was real until Ochek said, Come children, we have to leave before anybody in the village gets up. Just a few more minutes, Morgan said, still half asleep, with her mouth pressed against the hide blanket. Please? Seven minutes is like one second in earth time, right? She could still imagine she was home and that she actually had pressed the snooze button. Weird, she thought, imagining a real world instead of a fantasy one. Sorry, Ochek said, your presence here needs to remain a secret and to get where we need to go, leaving now is best. Ah, great, win-win. What does that mean? Two things can't win at the same time. She's being sarcastic. Eli was out of bed looking like he'd already had a, straw, a pot of strong coffee. She doesn't really think it's great or a win-win. I almost froze to death last night, so I'm tired, Morgan said. Sue me. The point is, if Council found out I was keeping humans with me, I don't know what decision they would make. Well, you catch all the food, don't you? Morgan asked, finally pushing herself out of bed. What are they going to do, banish you? Ochek shrugged, as though she had made a good point. The next, the last time they saw a human, he left them in eternal winter, Morgan, Eli said. They probably won't like seeing us. I'm up, I'm up already, Morgan said. They ate the same meal for breakfast as they had for dinner, dried meat and broth. Underwhelming, but as filling as one could expect in a village that was desperately hungry. Eating even the thumb-sized jerky they were given made Morgan feel guilty. She lamented that in her haste to follow Eli, she had not packed a snack. If she had, she wouldn't have had, wouldn't have had to eat what little food Misawa had left. Ochuk prepared a pack for each of them to bring on their journey to the trap line. And soon after finishing breakfast, they set off through what felt like an abandoned village. If firelights had not been visible through the windows of the seven longhouses, you'd never have guessed there was anyone in Misawa but the three of them. What other walking, talking animals are there? Morgan's fantasy-loving brain wanted to see them all. She only knew for sure there was Ochek and Musqua. I've only ever seen Ochek, Eli said. Every time I've gone out, we've left just as early. I'm not that excited to see a huge walking bear, she admitted, but like a turtle or something would be awesome. Maybe it would look like a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Oh, what if its traditional name just happened to be Raphael or something? At home, if we saw a bear, we would lay tobacco down because bears mean healing, Eli said. Hmm, that only makes them seem slightly less scary to me. I was scared seeing them too, he admitted. Musqua used to be feared in that way a long time ago, Ochek said. Now he is a respected elder and leader. Well, how do you go from being one thing to another? Morgan asked. He learned humility, Ochek replied and left it at that. Morgan had been afraid that the North Country might be stuck in a never-ending blizzard with strong freezing wind all the time and snow that felt like needles poking against her skin. She was relieved to find the weather pretty calm. There was wind, but it wasn't heavy. It was cold, but not biting. Morgan considered that this may have been because Ochek had given her clothing to wear that was a lot warmer than her hoodie. Still, the terrain was difficult. The trees were thick and the woods felt endless. The snow drifted even in the forest, which made it difficult to find footing. The wind had blown down trees, which forced the group to walk around. They headed southeast, and it was a long time before they stopped to rest. By the time they did, for lunch, Morgan was more tired than ever before. They found a spot to eat against a particularly large tree, and she felt like a rag doll collapsed at the trunk. How much longer? she asked, like a kid in the back seat on a road trip. We should be there by nightfall, Ochek assured her, but all that meant was that they had another half day's journey ahead. Their packs weren't all that big, but Morgan's was starting to feel like a boulder. Ochek and Eli got to work making their lunch, and Morgan could tell they had developed a routine. Although Morgan was tired, she helped as well. 
under the animal being's tutelage. As a group, they gathered kindling and wood, dug out a hollow in the snow, and built a fire. Eli looked proud in sparking the fire with stone. He exclaimed that, that was the first time he'd been able to. She was shown how to make broth with melted snow and pine needles. They ate the soup with dried meat. The day wore on and the sun began to set and the forest grew darker and colder. In the darkness, Morgan walked even closer to Ochek without really noticing. And whenever there was a sound that wasn't the wind, her head would jerk to attention. She would grab Ochek's arm and then quickly let go. Sorry, she would say each time. Quite suddenly, they came to a canyon that cut right through the forest. Who I hate this part. Eli crept to the edge of the cliff and looked down. Morgan could see why he had, she, sorry, Morgan could see why after she'd inched forward on her stomach. It felt safer to do it that way. There was a frozen river at the bottom of the canyon that looked like a massive snake. Morgan estimated the river to be at least 100 feet down. The canyon itself was 20 feet wide. On the other side, the forest started up again, as thick and wide as ever. So did you learn how to fly over the last two weeks? Morgan asked Eli. Eli just nodded to where Ochek was expertly walking across the canyon on top of a felled tree. Ha, ah, she said, fun? Come on. Eli followed Ochek across the canyon. He made his way more slowly than Ochek, but with good balance. Once there, he stood beside Ochek and looked to Morgan, who was still on her stomach. Morgan, just give me a second. Morgan pushed herself to her feet in slow motion. Her heart beat faster the closer she got to the bridge. She walked slowly and stalled further when she got there by deciding to inspect how the tree had been cut down. That was Amesk's work, Ochek said. That means beaver, Eli called over the expanse. Eli, shut up. Morgan was busy with her thumping heart and shaking body, which wasn't shaking at all from the cold. The shaking wasn't helping her confidence in walking across the canyon. Looking at it now, the tree couldn't have been more than two feet wide. I might as well be tightrope walking, she thought. I can't do it, she said. You've got great strength in you, Ochuk told her. This is a really bad time to talk like a fantasy character, she said. It's either come here or go back on your own, Eli said. Morgan looked behind her into the forest and all she could see was night. No snow, no trees, just a black hole ready to suck her up into oblivion. Heights are the dark. It was the balancing of fears. She turned back. Okay, she said, I'm coming across. She took a deep breath, swung her leg over the trunk and pushed herself to her feet. She spread her arms out for balance and took a step forward, then another. At the very least, she was glad the weather was forgiving. She couldn't imagine doing this in the sort of wind she had arrived in. Another step, followed by another. There may not have been wind, but the bark on the tree was slippery. For that, Morgan was glad Katie had given her moccasins. She could curl her toes around for some grip. You're almost there, Eli said once she was halfway across. Up until then, Morgan had kept her eyes trained on Eli the whole time and pretended she was just walking along a fallen tree, not a fallen tree stretched over a profoundly deep canyon. That way, if she fell, it wouldn't be to crash onto a frozen river a hundred feet below. It'd be like dropping in a snowdrift. But prompted by Eli's encouragement, she made the mistake of looking down. Everything began to spin like a kaleidoscope and her foot slipped. Morgan heard Ochek and Eli cry out. She screamed as she toppled over and reached out in desperation. Both her arms managed to connect with the tree. Her fingers gripped the ridges of bark, but with leather mitts, she couldn't hold on. I'm coming, Eli said. Morgan watched him get back on the tree bridge and make his way towards her. He wouldn't get there in time. Her arms and hands were sliding off, her fingertips unable to find a good hold. She let go with one hand and shook her mitt off, then quickly grabbed onto the tree again. She did the same with the other hand. As soon as her skin was exposed to the cold, her fingers started to get numb and stiff. It didn't matter that she could get a better grip. Hurry, Morgan said. I'm trying, Eli said. Morgan tried to pull herself up to force her fingers to work again, but her hands slipped off the bark. No, Eli shouted. Images flooded into Morgan's mind. The drawing, 
Ochek, Mrs. Edwards, her poem, their secret room. Finally, her mother rocking her back and forth. Oh, Kiski sat at Tohtaso. As she fell, Morgan reached with one hand and her fingers grabbed onto a frost crack. She dangled there, her legs and one arm free. She watched them as though they weren't a part of her body. Morgan, grab on to me, Eli said. She looked up to see Eli straddling the tree and extending his arm towards her. Her fingers were losing their hold. Her body was tired and cold, every inch of it. I can't. Tears froze instantly on her cheeks. Yes, you can. I'm not going back without you. Their eyes met and he nodded at her. You can do it. Morgan closed her eyes, gathered every bit of strength she had left, and thrust her arm into the air towards Eli's outstretched hand. Just as the other lost its grip, she felt her hand connect with his forearm. He grabbed hold of her with his other hand and grunted as he pulled her up. Once her stomach was firmly against the tree, she rotated her body and sat up straight. She didn't even care that she couldn't feel her hands, but Eli must have noticed. Here, he took off his own mitts and handed them to her. Oh, thank you, she slipped her hands onto them. What about you? We can share. Eli started to back away toward an awaiting Ochek. Morgan slipped forward on her butt right behind him. When they got to the other side, she had never felt happier to have her feet on solid ground and tried her best not to think about going over the worst bridge in history again on the way back to Missoula. They all just stood there, looking at each other in a state of shock and relief until Morgan said, please tell me we're almost there. The group burst out into laughter. We're not almost there, Ochek said once they had quieted. We're here. 